to another weekly live stream with yours truly, Dr. Sarah L. Webb of Colorism Healing. Today's topic is pretty privilege, and we're talking about pretty privilege at the intersection of colorism, featurism, and texturism. So, all right, hopefully this is not a thing throughout the live stream, um, <laughs> the poor internet connection. Hopefully we can get through it. But as I was about to say, pretty privilege has been a topic of conversation for a lot of my followers in the comments. And, you know, when I posted the announcement that I was doing this topic for this week, I got so many comments of people talking about their experiences with being pretty, but not feeling pretty or like having pretty privilege, even though they don't feel pretty. People saying how like, oh, I have mixed responses or I have mixed feelings about this topic. Um, and so I'm really excited to start the conversation. And I'll say this is by no means the final word on pretty privilege. <laughs> like we're not going to um, resolve all aspects of pretty privilege in the short time we have here. But really, I'm excited that to acknowledge the existence of pretty privilege. And I think that's what a lot of people in the comments were happy about, you know, folks who are saying, oh, I'm excited that you're talking about this. I think it's, you know, starting to simply acknowledge the reality of pretty privilege is refreshing. And so I'm happy to do that today. And um, as always, you all who are watching live can leave comments. If you're watching the recording on YouTube, you can share your story there. Um, or if you're watching the podcast, you can reach out to me and talk more about your experiences as well. So for my folks who are watching live, I thank you for spending this time with me, for showing up and engaging in the chat as you usually do. So go ahead and say hello. Let me know where you're tuning in from and what the weather is like where you are. It's supposed to storm where I'm at, um, but I am not nearly as uh, concerned for us up here in Illinois as for the folks down on the Gulf Coast. So hopefully your loved ones in their homes have been safe and continue to be safe. Um, if you are down there, are no folks down there. Hello from BR. This is our Trauma Matters. I like your screen name. I'm from Baton Rouge too. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> uh, hey, Lucid Lois. Is, ooh, we're talking about pretty privilege. Yes, we are. I've been binge watching YouTube videos on this topic for a couple of months now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I definitely notice a lot of YouTube videos because as I mentioned last week like that's kind of how I come up with ideas every week and so I was really you know surprised that it was such it's such a um a topic that people are finding interest in or taking interest in so I want to get started on that hey from Springfield Illinois Keisha Overcast in Atlanta GA running man on the move all right K-Drama Oma says, hearts go out for those affected by Ida. Yes, for sure. Hey, Trey Lorraine. Hello here in Louisiana. Let's see. Tigny Gott says, hi from cloudy southern Washington. And Ebony Natural Curls, hi from London. It's always good to see my UK folks in the house. That's why I spell, um, knowing that I have an international audience, sometimes I spell colorism with a U in my hashtags because I know my folks like I think the U.S. is the only place that spells colorism without the U and so that's I think that's a little interesting bit of trivia there. <laughs> um, sun trying to break through at beach at the beach in Washington. Okay all right so kind of overcast and cloudy for most people if not raining altogether. All right so let me jump into pretty privilege and um, kind of talk about in a review of privilege in general. So I want to start there. I did a live stream that I can um, link to if you're watching the YouTube video. I'll link to it in the description and on the podcast. I'll put that in the description as well. But I did a podcast on privilege in general. So I think it's important to kind of cover some basics about privilege, all the various forms of privilege. And so the first one I think is to keep in mind is that some people have more privileges than others, but most of us have some form of it. Even if you're not the most privileged person in the world, it's still likely that you have some form of privilege. If you're able to watch or listen to or read any of this here online, then there's some degree of privilege that you might have. 
The second thing is that privilege is not all or nothing. This is a huge hurdle or stumbling block our point of confusion, our defensiveness that people have when we talk about privilege is that people think, well, if I don't have privilege in every area of my life every day, all day, then I don't have any privilege at all. Or that the little bit of privilege I have doesn't matter, right? And so I, I use money and wealth to, as an analogy a lot of times because I think people can relate to that. So that's kind of like saying, because I'm not a millionaire that it doesn't matter if I make a hundred K a year, right? Like, no, it still matters that you make six figures a year, even if you're not a millionaire. And so we don't have to, we shouldn't think of privilege as if I'm not, you know, drowning in privilege, right? Or like um, immersed in privilege at every turn in my life, then I don't have any. Um, the third thing I'll say is that you don't have to be aware of your privilege to benefit from it. You don't have to be aware of your privilege to have it. Saw how my lighter skin gave me any advantage. I'm like, that's fine that you didn't see it or that you didn't recognize it, but that doesn't mean it didn't give you an advantage, right? And so we have to know that privilege is that it's always working for you whether you are consciously aware of it or not like that's part of what makes it a privilege is that you don't have to think about it you don't have to be aware of it because it's happening like in the background it's happening for okay i'm back <laughs> y'all i'm sorry that this connection is acting up i have like all of the bars on the wi-fi signal so i don't know why it keeps pausing um but the other thing I'll say about privilege is um, it's important not to equate having full experience with not having privilege, right? So some people say, well, I have experienced all this pain, so I can't possibly have privilege. And it's important to know that pain and privilege often coexist, right? They can exist at the same time and they often exist at the same time. And so, yes, you can have pain and still have privilege. And um, sometimes the thing that makes you privileged also makes you a target for resentment or backlash. So let's go back to the money analogy, okay? Being wealthy is a form of privilege. And yet being wealthy can make you a target for theft and robbery. Being wealthy can make you a target for fake friends who only want to get close to you to take advantage of your money, right? Those are very negative experiences. And yet the threat of those negative experiences does not negate the privilege of being wealthy, right? So the song, more money, more problems. Yes, more money, more problems. Money does not come free of issues. It doesn't come free of any sort of problem or complication. And yet the reality of having money still being a form of privilege is very real. And so as we talk about things like pretty privilege, a lot of people who are considered pretty in the larger society talk about the problems that come with that and how there are negative consequences to being objectified and that sort of thing. But that reality doesn't negate the privileges that come with being pretty as well or being perceived as pretty. So that's some things to keep in mind when we talk about privilege overall. Hey folks, come on in the room. We are talking about pretty privilege. And uh, I was just doing a review of privilege in general. And my Wi-Fi has been kind of spotty, so let me keep going. Let me get as much in while it lasts. <laughs> um, so pretty privilege, I have to say that the first time I heard this term was listening to a talk by Janet Mock. And so Janet Mock has talked a lot about pretty, pretty Privilege, but she's also written an article about Pretty Privilege, which I'll also link to in the YouTube and podcast description boxes. And so I think the article is from Allure and like Janet Mock has a column where she talks about the intersections of like beauty and other aspects of identity. And so Janet Mock explains Pretty Privilege in general, but she also talks about it from her specific intersections of being um, a brown skinned, mixed with black um, trans woman 
who's also slender yet curvy, right? And so she acknowledges like the various facets of her appearance and her identity that um, privilege her in many ways and that don't privilege her in many ways. And her article, I think, has a couple of quotes that I think are worth reading. And so she says, pretty privilege can give way to more popularity, higher grades, more positive work reviews and career advancement. People who are considered pretty are more likely to be hired, have higher salaries, and are less likely to be found guilty and are sentenced less harshly. Pretty people are perceived as smarter, healthier, and more competent. And people that, and people treat pretty people better. And then she also says pretty privilege is also conditional and often not extended to women who are trans, black, brown, disabled, older, and or fat, right? And so that's a quote by Janet Mock. And so like her article is worth reading in its totality, but I thought that that was one important quote. Um, and she also acknowledges, just like I did er you know, a few seconds ago, how a lot of you know, pretty people are objectified or exoticized or people will stereotype a the pretty girl is not being intelligent or is um, not having the same work ethic, right? Like, oh, if you're pretty, you're probably lazy. You don't have to work as hard. Or, you know, you just got this job because you're cute. And so I want to read one more quote by Janet Mock that I think is like just chef's kiss in terms of responding to that dynamic. And she says, I've noticed that it's more acceptable for pretty women to complain about objectification, the male gaze, and the ways in which beauty can undermine intelligence and contribution. But rarely do pretty women complain about, or rather acknowledge, the access their prettiness extends to them. And so she's talking about, you know, women who are considered pretty, but I see this a lot with light-skinned women as well, right? A lot of light-skinned women talk about being objectified, talk, uh, talk about, you know, becoming a sexual fetish. They talk about um, people thinking that they didn't work hard to earn their positions in society, right? And I hear a lot of, you know, light-skinned women in particular talk about that, you know, symptom. But they're less likely to then be just as vocal and just as transparent about the ways that their light skin has given them real, real benefits and tangible um, advantages and leverage in society as well. Okay, let me pause for a second. Um, thank you, Sarah Bestwill for the badge, yay. Um, your continued support is hugely appreciated. And you're watching from Ontario, Canada this week. Ah, finally on a little family vacay. Awesome. Congrats on being able to take a family vacation. Um, Brittany Cannon says, so how does that work? Being viewed as more competent and not as smart. Um, so it's the assumption, for example, when we're looking at like politicians or even if we're talking about, you know, in schools, right? The halo effect, um, like a little girl in fifth grade who's considered pretty is also more likely to be considered, you know, the smart girl. But because of the, the ways that pretty people are given access just based on their looks, people also have come to assume or come to stereotype them as not having had to work as hard, right? And this is like mostly in the instance of like the quote unquote dumb blonde stereotype, right? Thinking about girls like um, the legally blonde stereotype, right? Like, oh, you know, you're pretty to look at, but there's nothing up here. However, I think beauty in general, right? And so this is for men and women that people look at those that they see as unattractive or, you know, ugly even, like if they have that, I don't look at people as ugly, right? So it's hard for me to say these things <laughs> because I don't use that term to describe people. Um, uh, thinking that, oh, well, subconsciously, 
you're probably less capable. You're probably less intelligent, right? Um, and there are studies even that show politicians who get elected are usually perceived to be the more beautiful or the prettier or the more handsome candidate, right? And how perceptions of competence also tie to that halo effect of perceptions of being beautiful or like aesthetic, classically um, attractive, right? Whether you're male or female or non-binary. Um, and that's the other thing I want to talk about too, is that um, for men, so pretty, the word pretty is a gendered description and it's often associated with, you know, feminine, girl, woman um, types of descriptions, right? So pretty is associated with femininity. And, and yet men also have a form of pretty privilege. And when I think about colorism, a lot of dark-skinned men are perceived as heartthrobs, are considered gorgeous. Oh my gosh, he's so gorgeous. And like they will have really, really dark skin. But what you'll notice about those men is that they also have more Eurocentric features. They have slimmer noses, thinner lips. They usually have like a very refined facial structure, um, usually are slimmer and more athletically built, right? And so the, the black men, the dark-skinned men who are considered acceptable, who are able to um, sort of benefit from perceptions of competence and intelligence have certain features and certain hair textures, right? And so that's that intersection there that even for dark-skinned men, to be perceived as attractive, because many, many of them are. A dark-skinned man is far more likely to be perceived in the larger culture as beautiful than a dark-skinned woman. Um, but yet and still, when a dark-skinned man is looked at as attractive, think about the Tay Diggs and the Tyrese's and the even Idris Elba, right? They have thinner features. As opposed to, I think about us, like my students when I was teaching high school, I taught at a predominantly black high school and the dark skinned boys who were accepted, who were the cool ones or who um, had social clout, right? They were not, and who were perceived as more intelligent, right? By other teachers who were given the benefit of the doubt in terms of their competence and performance in class. It was not the ones with the wide noses and the larger features, right? They were, that association with those features in particular is associated with a lack of intelligence. And that's just, I think, a subconscious conditioning that we have. And again, not all of this is conscious thinking, right? And so when we talk about perceptions of intelligence or competence or health or, um, virtue even like pretty people that we think are attractive we also assume they're more virtuous when we look at disney movies and the villains always have some kind of deformity or like physical disability or they're over you know plus size like ursula and the little mermaid right like the villains are always the furthest from the cultural standard of prettiness or beauty right um in various ways and so culturally we've been conditioned to think that those who more closely match the cultural standards of beauty are also like the protagonist, the good person. They are the superhero. And so there are so many associations that we tie to that um, cultural standard of beauty. All right. Let me see what some of these comments are coming through. It says, appreciate the both and of pretty privilege. I admit that I've noticed my pretty privilege in the dark skin community, but it doesn't extend into the black community. Oh, um, DS community, let's say black community, hence the term pretty for, okay, you, so it is DS dark skin. Yeah, I use a, that abbreviation for dark skin as well and not everyone um, has caught on to that yet. Um, but yeah, pretty for a dark skin girl. And I'll say too that light skin is considered inherently pretty. Slender noses are considered inherently, like it's just automatic that that is pretty. Light colored eyes, automatically considered pretty. Even if you've never seen a person 
If someone says, oh yeah, she's light-skinned with light eyes, like people will say, oh, she must be pretty, right? Even if they've never seen that person before, knowing that they have light skin and long hair and light colored eyes, people already assume that, oh, well, that's an attractive person. And I think this is a good example. A good example of this is when you hear black folks tell an interracial couple, oh, y'all gonna have pretty babies, right? Now, how, okay, raise your hand if you know what people mean when they say you're gonna have pretty babies, right? Pretty babies is shorthand for light skin, long curly hair, light eyes, you know, slender features, right? It's like pretty has become synonymous with those features, like they're synonyms for each other, right? Like you can either say, oh, the baby is light skin, light eyes, loose curls, or you can say the baby is pretty and people know that you mean the same thing, right? And, and so a lighter skinned person is more likely to have pretty privilege than a darker skinned person because lighter skin is perceived as inherently pretty, right? And yet a light skinned person who has a wide nose and dark brown eyes and type four hair will not benefit from as much are the same degree of pretty privilege as a light-skinned person who's their same color, but has green eyes or has long straight hair, right? And so these intersections, again, going back to what I was saying earlier about privilege being degrees. And just because you're not the most privileged person doesn't mean you don't have any privilege. And even acknowledging how, you know, I think about my sister with this one, because my sister is several shades lighter than me, but we have essentially the same nose and lips, right? And so growing up in school, she definitely benefited from light skin privilege and she definitely had benefited from pretty privilege, but she also experienced the like, well, but I'm not like other light skin girls, right? Who either might be biracial or mixed race or who are, you know, in Louisiana, they just come from a long line of like really light skin family and ancestry. And so even she, you know, her hair texture is not as tightly coiled as mine, but it also, you know, could not be straightened with just a blowout, right? Like she had to get it chemically straightened in order for it to look straight. And so there is, you know, this is why I also say even amongst mixed race people, for example, like there is that colorism. Not all light-skinned people experience the same degree of light-skinned privilege, right? Not all light-skinned people experience the same degree of pretty privilege, right? And yet, the, the correspondence with light skin and femininity and prettiness with femininity, again, makes it more likely that to be light skin is to be pretty. Another way to think about it, if prettiness is seen as a feminine trait and light skin is seen as a feminine trait, then you're more likely to be considered pretty if you're light-skinned, right? Whereas dark skin is masculinized, right? Darker skin has is associated, people assume that it's a more masculine trait. And so if darker skin is seen as the more masculine trait and prettiness is considered a feminine trait, you're less likely to be seen by other people as pretty if you're darker skin, right? And so this is colorism. But I think about people like Tika Sumter, um, Keisha Knight Pullum, um, Aja Naomi King from um, How to Get Away with Murder, right? I think about even Naomi Campbell, like really the dark skinned women in our society who are icons of prettiness, right? Who are the pretty girls. And the one thing they have in common is slender noses, right? Even my favorite, Issa Rae, like I love me some Issa Rae, but her features are not like my features. Her nose in particular is not nearly as wide as my nose, right? And so the, they are gorgeous women, but a lot of the roles that they are allowed to play, they are allowed to play the pretty dark skinned girl because of their features, right? And so they still experience colorism as dark skinned women, but they don't experience the same degree of colorism relative to other dark-skinned women with broader features, right? And so we have to think about featureism, colorism, and texturism, texturism intersectionally. Tatiana Ali, for example, has, you know, a more petite nose. She has the thinner lips and she also has long hair. 
So she, throughout her career, has been allowed to play the pretty girl, even though she was darker skinned. Whereas, you know, someone with my kind of nose and my kind of hair is almost never cast as the romantic interest or as the lead character or as the pretty friend, right? And so these are dynamics that even if you are darker skinned, you still might have privilege relative to other dark skinned people. So not all dark skinned people experience marginalization to the same degree or in the same way. And then for me, I talk about my size as a dark skinned woman. It's not the same for me as someone with my same color, same hair texture, same features, but who is also in a larger sized body, right? And that's something that I've been very clear about my entire life. Like it's, it's part of the reason why I have a hard time understanding why other people don't recognize or acknowledge their privilege, right? Or why people will say, well, um, I don't know if dark skinned people have it hard because I'm not dark skinned. And I'm like, but I'm thin and I've always been thin. And yet I know what that means in society, right? Like I've seen and observed who gets put on the cover of magazines, who gets cast in the leading roles, who's the love interest and who's their funny sidekick, right? Who's their funny best friend. Um, and I see also like the outright explicit hatred and bullying of people with larger bodies. And so I think even for us dark skinned women who um, experience colorism, we can still benefit to some degree of pretty privilege, right? Even if we're not considered like the prettiest girl in the world um, because we don't match all of the European standards of beauty, we can still acknowledge that we have given, there are times when we've been given space, we've been given access, we've escaped or avoided like dehumanizing or demeaning ostracization because of our features or our hair texture, right? Um, and then one other thing I want to say, too, about pretty privilege is that it's also about the packaging of your features. So it's, yeah, your natural features can be a source of pretty privilege, but it's also how you package them. And so for women and femmes and non-binary folks, we have various ways of increasing the likelihood that we're perceived as pretty. The most obvious one is makeup, right? So a lot of people will wear makeup to increase the likelihood that people perceive them as pretty. Also the kinds of hairstyles we choose. People choose long straight hair because it increases the likelihood that people will perceive you as cute, as pretty, right? But I'll also say, so here's the, the kicker, that the degree to which you have to focus on the packaging um, illustrates how little pretty, pretty privilege you actually have, right? So people who have the most pretty privilege don't have the burden of feeling like, oh, I have to have a full face of makeup. Oh, I have to make sure my hair is done perfectly. Oh, I have to make sure my outfit is perfectly put together, right? So the more pretty privilege you benefit from, the less stress you have about being able to wake up and wear sweatpants to the bank, right? Or being able to, you know, take a selfie without any makeup on and, you know, not be scared to post it. And so I think the all of these nuances come into play. And I've even had people in my comments when I made the announcement talk about how they had a lot of pretty privilege when they had when they wore their hair long and straight, but the minute they chopped it off, like people were like, "Oh, you're not as pretty anymore." <laughs> you know? Um, okay, let me see these comments. And I think most of my main points I've gotten to. So I'm really curious to see what people have been saying here. Um, Ebony Natural says, definitely pertains to men as well and how we all align ourselves along the continuum of pretty to ugly. Yeah, a continuum is a good word, Ebony Natural curls. Continuum is a good word. And I think, again... Because I, I get so much pushback, y'all, because I talk about this stuff all the time. So I'm, I hear a lot of like resistance and defensiveness. And so people talk about how, oh, well, you know, I'm not white, so I don't benefit from white privilege. And so therefore, my light skin privilege doesn't matter. Or I'm not um, 
a man and so I don't benefit from male privilege and so my pretty privilege doesn't matter because I'm still oppressed in a patriarchal society. Um, but again, like if we're all standing in, li in a line, right? Like you might only be one position in front of me in line to get a donut, for example, and yet you might get the last donut, right? And so that one position in front of me, even though you weren't at the front of the line, you still had access to more opportunities than me because you were just one position in front of me. And so all of the positions matter, right? And all of the, and when we talk about equality and equity for people, um, it's not about, um, well, I don't have the most, so I don't have to like consider my privileges. It's like, yeah, but you still have more than someone else, right? You might not have the most, but you still have a lot more than other people. And so, yes, that still matters. Um, okay. Uh. <laughs> See, Kim Ken says, type four hair with a wider nose. Definitely noticed how those intersections affected my degree of privilege. You put it so well. Thank you, Ken Ken. Because sometimes I be talking and I'm like, I hope these people understand. Because <laughs> it makes sense to me. And I'm just like, can it? Can I get it out in a way that makes sense? Um, Lucid Lowe says, oh, wow. I heard a YouTuber say today that white men typically see black women as beautiful more than black men do. But they prefer darker skinned black women like Nilos and Sudanese. Um, is that a form of pretty privilege? So I think pretty privileged in terms of how I'm thinking about it is not necessarily tied to sexual attraction, right? And I think that's like part of this discussion is that um, a lot of it centers around sexual attraction and desire desirability, particularly like in heteronormative contexts. Um, and I think that's why people who have pretty privilege um, focus so much on the male attention, like attention from men and don't acknowledge the ways like, no, like being perceived as pretty in society, like also means you are treated better at work. It means that when you go to the bank, people are less likely to think you're about to rob the place, right? Like all these other instances. Um, but I don't, well, A, I think it's hard to like define a white man's attraction to like a really dark skinned person or like a Sudanese woman as pretty privileged because I don't know if it's systemic enough. I don't know if that instance is systemic enough to be considered like pretty privileged, right? Um, yeah, so that's my thoughts on that, right? Like I don't know enough about that dynamic. And to be honest, um, I can't, I don't know, I don't know, like, if white men are more likely to see black women as attractive as black men, right? Like, that's, maybe that's something we can discuss. I don't, I'm trying to think about, you know, anything else I've read that might point to that. Um, but I honestly don't think, I don't, yeah, I'm stuck on that one, <laughs> Lucy Lose. You stumped me, because I'm, I think what, what I'm struggling with with that question is the assumption that white men are more likely to find those women attractive than black men. A, because if we're talking about an international context, like do they mean white men versus African-American men or like white men versus black men all over the world, right? And like, so I think that question is like really troubling for me to like fully respond to, but we can definitely continue that conversation as well. Um, Trey Lorraine says, we can see these standards of beauty within filters on social media as well. Yeah, the social media filters are a big one that people talk about in terms of uh, not only do the filters like lighten your skin tone, but a lot of times they'll like add makeup or they'll add long eyelashes or they'll like highlight your cheekbones or like, you know, they'll add contouring in a way. Really interesting filters. Black Knight 06, 26.2 says, is featureism good or bad? And what shall we do about it if it is bad? Yeah, so featureism is bad in the sense that it's like colorism or sizeism or ageism or ableism, right? So it's the expectation that, you're, that you look 
like this very narrow norm, like this very narrow expectation of what is acceptable. But even more so than just the like the aesthetics of prettiness are all of the associations of prettiness, like being more competent, being more virtuous, being safer, being more innocent, right? I think that's when it really becomes a problem is that it's not just like, oh, I like ice cream. I like chocolate ice cream. You like butter pecan ice cream. And that's that. It's like, no, I think this person is pretty. And therefore, subconsciously, I also think they're more innocent. I also think they deserve more grace and more compassion. And because they're prettier, I'm also going to protect them and defend them in the face of trouble. I'm going to throw my support. I'm going to mentor them. I'm going to sponsor them because they're the cute one, right? You think about, um, you know, classrooms are classic cases of this, right? Teachers um, defending or coddling or even um, supporting and giving the benefit of the doubt, to the cute little girls, right? Or to the cute little boys or to the handsome little boys. And the boys and the girls that they don't see as attractive, the boys and the girls that they don't see as cute are the bad ones, are the less intelligent ones, are the, the troubled students, right? And so that's why it really becomes an issue. It's not if it were only like, oh, they don't think I'm cute, but they treat me the same way, then we probably wouldn't need to have this discussion but the problem is that who we perceive as cute also determines how we treat them. Unless we're actively trying not to do that, right? Like the people watching probably don't do this, but society as a whole does do this. Um, Lucid Lowe says, exactly. I am natural and I don't straighten my hair often, but when I do, I get treated so much better. It kind of hurts my feelings. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry that people, you know, can't, um, find it in themselves to treat you treat you the way you deserve to be treated no matter what your hair looks like, right? Like that is an unfortunate thing. Um, Trey Lorraine says it makes so much sense. It makes total sense. Thank you, Lucid Los. You are a real one. <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to, your, your question like really is gonna make me think. And so now I need to go and do some research on that particular topic. Um, hey, Jordan Sambu says, what do you think of people who say that the construction of beauty doesn't include black people because beauty is political? The halo effect too. pretty teachers engaging in inappropriate relationships with students are given more leniency. Interesting. Um, Missy Camille, Mix Fat Chick, Latanya R. Moore says, yes, even in social, even in media, I notice how the white our light girls are always being rescued and protected. This further conditioning view viewers, if they're not aware, to believe light skin or white skin need protection. So Latanya R. Moore, absolutely. I posted a question on my personal Facebook profile asking how many movies have you seen where someone's like risking their life to save a black woman? Bonus points if she's a dark skinned black woman, right? And so yeah, the, the social conditioning that like, oh, we're going to save and rescue and support and care about and value and like risk our lives to defend and stand up for these white slash light women. And the movies with dark skinned women, the dark skinned women are either saving ourselves or we are the villain or we are the bully or the antagonist, right? Or we're saving other people, right? But rarely is it a dark skinned woman having people come to her aid, coming to her defense. Usually she's the one like kicking butt and saving other folks, right? And bearing the burden of saving the community, right? Like, yeah, all those expectations. Missy Camille says, it's more than how you're treated day to day. It can literally change your lifestyle and income. Right, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you for putting it in those very clear terms, Missy Camille. Um, if you got, if you get the job because someone perceives you as being prettier, 
whether it's conscious or not, then you literally, that could literally change the entire trajectory of your life and getting the promotion. Like when Janet Mock, so I don't know how many of you were here when I was reading the Janet Mock quotes, but Janet Mock said that, you know, pretty people are more likely to get positive work reviews. So when you're going up for review um, at your workplace, you're more likely to get a positive review. Customers, clients are more likely to think um, you're kinder and that your customer service is better and that you're more polished and you're more professional and like, oh, we just we just really like um, so-and-so's, you know, I don't know, work or service. And we don't even acknowledge or realize how much of that is tied to your aesthetic appearance. Jordan, um, what do you think of this take? Beautiful people are morally bankrupt because beauty is a violent construct that they are invested in maintaining at the detriment of people considered ugly. Um, so I was actually going to ask you to clarify your earlier question too about... Um, Sam's the beauty not including black people because beauty is political, right? But in terms of that question specifically, you know, the idea that beautiful people are morally bankrupt. bankrupt. Um, one, I've talked about this in, re in relation to colorism specifically and why light-skinned people should not be invested in colorism um, or like the, the negative consequences of being valued for your light skin as opposed to like your actual integrity and personality and like skills um is because it does um sort of bankrupt i don't know if it's like more bankrupt what is what words would i use for that um if you don't develop like your true or actual personality and so you do have stories of people who've always been considered pretty, who never took the time to develop other aspects of their life, or who never took the time to develop other aspects of their personality because they were like, okay, my physical appearance is what's getting me into rooms. My physical appearance is what is my social capital. So I'm investing totally in that, right? And then something happens, they start to age, and like, you know, like Janet Mock said, like older people are not, are no longer considered the pretty ones, right? And so then you're like, okay, well, what else do I have, right? And so, yes, it can create like a shallowness or a hollowness of personality if you invest in that form, that social structure, if you invest in that um, cultural practice, right, of exchanging beauty for, you know, access to things and value. Um, but yeah, I think, so here's the other thing I'll say too, is that I don't think being pretty is in, makes, inherently makes you bad for one, but also pretty privilege is slipperier than other types of privilege, right? So if we talk about cis male privilege, right? Like that is a more concrete marker, whereas we might perceive people as pretty. We might perceive someone as gorgeous, like downright gorgeous, and yet they don't have pretty privilege, right? And there are people that we might look at and say, oh, well, she's not that pretty. Like, I don't think she's that pretty. And yet she very much does have pretty privilege, right? And so one way to think about pretty privilege is like how closely do you align with the social standard, the social idea of pretty? And so there are people walking around who a lot of people see as pretty, but they don't necessarily have pretty privilege. Because like, when I look at myself, I see pretty, but I don't have pretty privilege the way a Beyonce or an Alicia Keys has pretty privilege, right? Um, yeah, so I think that also makes the conversation complicated, right? And you, so it's, it's we have to be, careful to embrace the nuances of all of this. Um, so Jordan, thank you. Basically, Black people don't have political beauty because the construction of beauty is rooted in white supremacy and anti-Blackness and thus never meant to include us. Sidebar, this isn't my take. <laughs> oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. So the reality of 
beauty standards being put in place to uphold white hegemony, right? Like white supremacy. The those beauty standards are perpetuated and um, reinforced in society as a way to maintain the dominant status of white people. Um, and I think things like the Black is Beautiful movement are indicative of that reality, right? And so in order to pres preserve the position of white as supreme, it also has to be beautiful. And we need a direct contrast to that, which would be black. And so if black is supposed to be the direct opposite of white, which was beautiful, then that means black had to inherently be ugly, right? And so yeah, that dynamic was definitely part of the, the white power structures tactics. It was definitely a tactic of, you know, white domination. <laughs> And I think that's why when people talk about beauty being political and like um, the Black is Beautiful movement was a political movement, like Black beauty is political for that reason, right? And so when people talk about, oh, it's it doesn't matter, it's not important. I think, you know, I'm actually glad you bring that up, Jordan, because it, it re reminds us that domination, oppression is not just the obvious forms of oppression, right? Like the reason why the there is such deep rooted power structures is because it's infiltrated every idea, every notion, every facet, every minuscule crevice of life. <laughs> And so it's all political. Like what you eat is political, how you dress is political, how you wear your hair is political, what you talk like is political. Taking a selfie and posting it on social media, especially as a dark-skinned black woman with 4C hair, that's political, right? Um, and so yeah, beauty has beauty is a political thing. And so embracing black beauty, celebrating black beauty is undermining, is subverting the notion of black inferiority, right? That's part of that too. And so no, like discussions about beauty and black beauty in particular are not trivial or um, inconsequential at all. Let's see. Pretty is subjective in many cases unless it properly aligns with your centricity. Yeah, yeah, and I think, um, like, again, like people who would like a lot of people say, oh, you're gorgeous. You're so beautiful. You're so pretty when they like comment on my posts and like my TikTok videos and stuff like that. And yet those people are aware that because of racism, colorism, texturism, featureism, that I would not have pretty privilege in the sense of, you know, aligning with the social norms of prettiness and beauty. Jordan says, I believe this for this issue to be resolved, capitalism will have to die because there are entire industries that feed all beauty standards and everyone participates in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I think a lot of um, folks who talk about oppression talk about how we have to dismantle all forms of oppression. And one of the reasons why we haven't successfully um, liberated ourselves from one form of oppression is because we're trying to cling to a different form of oppression that upholds the oppression we think we care about, right? So you have a lot of people, a lot of black people, for example, let's use that as an example, who are like, yeah, you know, we want racial equality and we want to like dismantle white supremacy. And we want, you know, black liberation, but we really like capitalism. We really like that. And so, <laughs> We're sabotaging our efforts. We're sabotaging our work to, you know, for racial liberation because we aren't ready to let go of capitalism. And so same thing with like patriarchy and sexism. Like all the white women who claim to be feminists and all the white women who claim, you know, to want women's liberation are clinging to racism. They don't want to let go of their white privilege. They don't want to address the racial dynamic of that. And similarly, I know a lot of white people who are like, yeah, class first, class.
class, you know, class, 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 class. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but your whiteness is a uh, social currency as well. <laughs> so you, if you're not also trying to talk about your white privilege, you ain't really going to get rid of class privilege either, you know? So yeah, like I think a lot of us sabotage the issues we think we care about because we're holding on to other issues that directly support and uphold um, other systems. Adria says, yes, subjugation can take on so many forms, both invisible and visible, are equally violent. Uh, like the modeling and entertainment industry fuel these beauty standards. Um, ugly people receive the death penalty and longer prison sentences. Ugly people receive little to no empathy. I agree with people who say that beauty is also a form of social class. What is the action to counter the social construct pretty privilege? Um, so there are a few things, and I'll end with that. Thank you, Black Knight 0626.2. And again, if you're watching the replay on YouTube or listening to the um, podcast, I will link to the article by Janet Mock that I referred to earlier, as well as my previous live stream on privilege in general. Um, yeah. So some things we can do to dismantle or to negate or overcome systems of pretty privilege are one, to call it out when we see it, right? And so having a conversation like this like making people aware that pretty privilege is a thing can help us um, override our implicit biases, right? And so we talk about like racial bias, color bias, gender bias. A lot of it is subconscious programming. And that's, I think that's so hard for people to, to really wrap their heads around is that even if you don't intend to give the pretty person greater advantages. And even if you don't intend to give the person you perceive as ugly a harsher prison sentence, your subconscious mind is going, might do it anyway, right? And so a lot of people, most people don't think that they're doing that, don't think or realize that they're affording advantages to people perceived as pretty and, you know, unjustly discriminating against people they perceive as ugly. So I think one of the first things we need to do is like, oh, this bias exists, this implicit bias exists, this conditioning exists. What am I doing to, A, mitigate the effect of that? And two, what can I do to reprogram my subconscious mind? What can I do to decondition my mind to those things. I'll say too that for all of us, we all have to be interrogating and critiquing what we believe is beautiful. We know for a long time, like the Black is Beautiful movement was meant to do that. It was one like example of people trying to do that. But we all have to like even amongst that movement, like my black is beautiful, black is beautiful, or brown and proud, or pretty brown girls, right? Um, like we have to continue to question and self-reflect and like, okay, where in my own psyche do I still have a limited perspective of what's pretty, of what's beautiful, right? And you can start with yourself. So, you know, <laughs> I can't, you know, ask people to, you know, say this on the live or in the chat, but I know a lot of people who follow me struggle with seeing themselves as pretty, struggle with seeing themselves as beautiful, right? And so we have to start there, yes, but then for all of us also realizing like, why um, am I more likely to double tap on this person's selfie? And I'm more likely to like scroll past this other person's selfie, right? Like we have to be willing to ask ourselves those tough questions. Um, but it's so hard for people to, to say to themselves like, oh, whoa, like I still have some white supremacist beauty standards that I'm operating under, right? I still, man, like I am looking at all these dark skinned girls on um, Instagram and they're all skinny with hourglass figures and they all have straight hair and they all have thin noses, right? And so while I'm learning to like see the beauty in dark skinned girls, 
I'm still gravitating to the dark skinned girls with more Eurocentric features and with, you know, laid edges. And so continue to say that, continue to reflect and interrogate that. And another thing I'll say too is to advocate for people that society would deem ugly, right? Like, just like we were talking about the movies where, you know, people are saving the little, you know, ambiguously raced person. Like, oh, she's the protagonist. Like, do that for a little dark-skinned child that someone would consider ugly, right? Like, if you are um, a teacher and you see a teacher, like, fussing at a dark-skinned child and you know, like, okay, hold up. Like, step in. Like, step in in that moment and be like, why are you treating Tyrone so unfairly when you don't treat um, Stephen the same way, right? Like, or if they're, if you're an administrator or if you, even if you work in the news or if you work in the media, right? Like, call your colleagues out if they're only putting light skin or quote unquote pretty people um, on the front cover of the newspaper, right? Like, so again, be willing to check your own biases. Um, to recondition yourself to see beauty in a more broader sense. And then three, like speak up when you see it happening. Like come to the defense of people that are perceived as less attractive. So those are three practical things that anybody can do. Um, and I think the ripple effects of that, right? Like raising your children. When I, when I mentioned earlier that I don't use the term ugly to describe people, that's because my mom explicitly told me not to do it, right? So we start with ourselves, but the more we teach and talk to and influence other people to think the same way, like that's one way to create cultural change. Um, this is good homework. Yay! I'm light and raised by a beautiful dark-skinned mom. I've always been aware of and called it out. Pretty privilege is so much more nuanced, though. Calling it out is difficult since beauty is subjective. Yeah, because people can gaslight you and say, you know, what that is. that's not what it is. Um, Dr. Kulani, Kulanani does a lot of work on this. She is a psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, and understanding the concept of white goodness. Yeah, thank you, Andrea Jimenez. Um, thank you for the nuggets of knowledge. Um, of course, white goodness when someone confronts a white person's conditioning on, I am good, I am not racist, sex is harmful, I mean well. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan says, people have a hard time accepting the existence of colorism, so futurism will be an even harder pill to swallow for many. Yeah, but that's okay. Like, it might be hard to swallow, but... I ain't, that ain't gonna stop me from talking about it, right? Like, I just, I'm cautious about um, the understanding that people might resist this conversation as like a reason not to have it. And yeah, I don't think the alternative to that is to stay silent. So they might have a hard time swallowing it, but they gonna get it. <laughs> they gonna get it from me anyway. <laughs> All right, y'all, today is a big day for me. So I got to run and do some other things. <laughs> uh, so these sessions are always so grounding. I can see myself slipping back into white supremacist beauty standards when I'm not being intentional about who I surround myself with, both in person and online. Trey Lorraine, I love that statement. I think that's a great statement to close on. So I'll repeat it again, right? Because... This is this work is like um, bathing. Like we can't take a shower one time and think we're clean for the rest of the year. Like, oh, I took a shower last March. Like I'm good. Like, no, we have to continue to bathe, continue to brush our teeth, continue to wash our face on a regular basis. So I think Trey Lorraine says, you know, um, she says, I can see myself slipping back into white supremacist beauty standards when I'm not being intentional about who I surround myself with, both in person and online. So continue to interrogate yourself, continue to self-reflect. Um, it's, a, it's a perpetual process. Okay, 
Yes, thank you all. Thank you for these thoughtful and necessary conversations. Thank y'all. I really, I try to do justice. Like I really want to do justice to these conversations. I know I'm only one person and I'm by far not always like the most articulate or even the most informed on every single live stream that I do, but I know it's still my responsibility and my calling to have the conversation anyway. And I don't, because, you know, I don't want to cower in fear of, well, someone else said it better than me or someone else explains it better than I do. Like, but yeah, but I still have a responsibility to talk about it as well, right? Just like you all continue to talk about it in your own, you know, platforms and in your own families and communities. And you don't have to be like the star of the show every time you have the conversation because that's not the point, right? Um, so I appreciate your grace. I appreciate y'all's um, support, the people who buy badges from week to week. I appreciate your con contributions to the conversation. There's always like really interesting ideas that you all present. So yeah, let's keep having the conversation. Keep learning from each other and with each other. So thank you. Bye. Mwah. Mwah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Love y'all.